Today I'll teach you an anti-cancer hack that your favorite longevity influencer has never told you. Be it Peter Atia, be it Brian Johnson, be it Matt Caberline, with all due respect, I don't care, they have never told you this. But before I start this video, please bless us by leaving a like and a comment, subscribe to the channel if you like our content and you want to see more, and go to our website just to redeem your free gift. It is a course made by Brendan Henry himself called The Life-Changing Magic of Peptides, absolutely free, just to introduce you to the world of peptides that we love so much. My name is Dr. Ali and I am the Head Transformation Specialist at the Peptide Science Institute and today I'll walk you through real biohacking, real longevity biohacking by introducing you to a bit of a hack, a Faustian bargain if you will, that will help smokers potentially reduce their cancer risk massively. Now, everybody knows that smokers are predisposed to lung cancer a lot more than others so their odds ratios of developing lung cancer are 11 or 13 something like that so they're 11 to 13 times more likely than the uh, non-smoker to develop lung cancer however they're also predisposed to all kinds of cancers including a very aggressive form of cancer which is pancreatic cancer and specifically pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma and so for example in this meta-analysis they found with analyzing 82 studies, they found that smokers are on average 75% more likely to develop pancreatic cancer. And pancreatic cancer is extremely aggressive. So the question becomes why? Why are smokers so predisposed to different types of cancers even outside the lungs? Well, there's many reasons such as oxidative stress, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, hypoxia, the tons and tons of chemicals that are found in cigarettes and not even well studied honestly. But the one I wanted to discuss today, a mechanism that promotes carcinogenesis in smokers, is a disbalance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters, particularly noradrenaline and GABA. So let's focus on two receptors. One is called the alpha-7 nicotinicolinergic receptor, and the other is called the alpha-4 beta-2 nicotinicolinergic receptor. Now, Previously, scientists used to think that uh, nicotinicolinergic receptors were not really found outside the nervous system and neuromuscular junctions. However, that seems to not be true. Now we kind of know that uh, these receptors are found all over the body, the nicotinicolinergic receptors. Now, the alpha-7 nicotinicolinergic receptor is, uh, to put it simply, an excitatory receptor. When agonized, it usually uh, leads to the transmission of excitatory neurotransmitters such as dopamine, uh, noradrenaline, uh, glutamate, serotonin, etc. Serotonin is very excitatory in a lot of uh, situations. It can be inhibitory in some, but we're not going to get into that. The other receptor is the alpha-4 beta-2 nicotinic cholinergic receptor, and this is more of an inhibitory one. So the agonism of this receptor leads to the transmission of GABA. You may have heard that nicotinic cholinergic receptors will upregulate in response to a constant agonism or, let's say, chronic nicotine exposure, right? That is true, but not for all of them. So this upregulation is kind of a desensitization where protein expression is increased as a desensitization mechanism. And this seems to happen more in the alpha-4 beta-2 nicotinic cholinergic receptor, which is the inhibitory one that uh, downstream causes uh, GABA transmission but not so much in the alpha-7 nicotinicolinergic receptor. So smokers will have uh, increased signaling of uh, excitatory neurotransmitters, dopamine, uh, serato yeah, dopamine serotonin, uh, noradrenaline, adrenaline, glutamate, etc., and yet a lower transmission of GABA and lower GABAergic signaling. How is that significant? We will find out right now. Now let us dive a bit deeper into the mechanistic side of how noradrenaline promotes carcinogenesis or cancer, basically cancer growth. So number one, in this study on prostate cancer, specifically using PC3 human cell lines. So when these cells were incubated with 10 micromoles of noradrenaline, uh, the authors noticed migration was increased. However, treating those cells with 10 micromoles of uh, propranolol simultaneously with the noradrenaline almost neutralizes this effect. So it seems that noradrenaline, specifically via the agonism of its beta receptors, has a, a metastasis promoting effect. So migration specifically, when it's increased in cancer cell lines that are being studied in petri dishes, that's a proxy for metastasis. And adrenaline or noradrenaline seem to increase that via the beta receptors and propranolol seems to neutralize it. Now, the authors also utilized a breed of mice called uh, balb C mice. And they injected them in the thigh 
with these uh, PC3 uh, human prostate cancer cell lines. When these mice were treated with noradrenaline, the tumor, primary tumor did not exactly grow, but there was a metastasis into the lumbar lymph nodes. And in the animals that were treated with noradrenaline, the lumbar lymph nodes were on average 169% bigger than those in the control group. But in the mice that were treated with both noradrenaline and propranolol, the lymph node metastasis was minimized. In fact, the lymph node size compared to the control group was only 77% larger. And moving on to a mouse model of ovarian cancer, we see that when the mice are stressed and noradrenaline is increased, tumors are grown by over 187% compared to the control group. They stress the mice out with the social isolation and the number of nodules in the ovarian tumors increases by 255% compared to the control group. In addition, when the cells were treated in isolation with noradrenaline, uh, there seemed to be an enhancement of angiogenesis, which is the birth of new blood vessels. And this effect was neutralized by a compound called PTK787, which is an inhibitor of both uh, VEGF receptor 2 as well as several other tyrosine kinases potentially pointing towards noradrenaline activating these uh, carcinogenic tyrosine kinases and uh, having a either sensitizing effect on VEGF2, VEGF receptor 2 or a downstream mechanism that somehow promotes angiogenesis through that receptor potentially. And now moving on to colon cancer where in this study it was shown that in SW480 colon cancer cell lines GABA actually had an inhibitory effect on the carcinogenic and metastasis promoting effects of noradrenaline. So in terms of migration, adding noradrenaline, just like the previous study, promoted migration of these cells uh, being a proxy for metastasis again. However, GABA almost neutralizes this effect. The results also showed that noradrenaline raised cyclic AMP levels by 45%, whereas GABA lowered them by 48%. Another thing that adrenaline and noradrenaline raise inside SW480 cancer cell lines, colon cancer cell lines, is calcium. And when uh, the cells were treated with noradrenaline, the calcium levels intracellularly were increased significantly. But when they were treated with GABA alone and with the noradrenaline, there was no significant uh, difference in calcium levels intracellularly or uh, cytosolically. So what that means is the inhibitory effect of GABA on the carcinogenesis of noradrenaline is mostly mediated by cyclic AMP, it seems like. And now moving on to a study on pancreatic duct adenocarcinoma cell lines, particularly the cell lines PANC1 and uh, BXPC3, as well as immortalized human pancreatic duct epithelial cells HPDE6C7. And in this study, they used a carcinogenic compound called isoproteranol, which increases cyclic AMP levels. And against it, they used baclofen, a selective GABA-B receptor agonist, in order to test the carcinogenesis of the isoproteranol versus the baclofen, specifically in the context of raising cyclic AMP levels, which are carcinogenic, especially when they're at very high levels in cancer cells. And surprisingly, the baclofen, just through the GABA-B receptor agonism, was able to lower cyclic AMP levels after isoproteranol exposure below baseline. And another problem we can see with nicotine, particularly in this context, is that well, in this study on uh, human colon adenocarcinoma cells, we see that nicotine, of course, it promotes proliferation as expected, but it also seems to promote uh, the upregulation of enzymes that synthesize catecholamines, particularly uh, tyrosine hydroxylase and dopamine beta hydroxylase. Additionally, when an alpha-7 nicotinic receptor antagonist was introduced to this study, the proliferative effects of nicotine were neutralized. And when the beta blocker atenolol was introduced, also the proliferative effects seemed to be reversed. So this means that nicotine's proliferative effects seem to be happening through mainly these two receptors. So what's really the hack here? While baclofen did seem to work great through the GABA-B receptor, it is not really a sustainable option for smokers or non-smokers long term as uh, when you 
make your body think it has more GABA than it does, it's going to downregulate GABAergic signaling because GABA is a very conserved uh, neurotransmitter in the brain. The system is highly conserved. That's why, uh, for example, benzodiazepine withdrawal is the worst withdrawal ever. It can kill you. Baclofen withdrawal is not on the same level, but still it is not sustainable. It will screw up your memory. It'll uh, screw up your sleep patterns. It is just not a sustainable option to prevent cancer long term for a smoker. So what is? My idea is blocking adrenaline directly, particularly, in my opinion, if you're a smoker to block beta 1, 2, and 3 with propranolol or atenolol, and if you just use uh, nicotine pouches or snooze to at least use nebivalol to prevent the carcinogenic effects of nicotine, particularly due to the uh, disbalance between excitatory and inhibitory neurotransmitters. Now, when you go look at propranolol on all these cancers that I've listed, you'll see evidence of propranolol being uh, inhibitory of the progression of prostate cancer. You'll see propranolol inducing uh, apoptosis in uh, ovarian epithelial cell lines. You'll see propranolol inducing uh, apoptosis in colon cancer. You'll see that all over. Propranolol is profoundly anti-cancer, more so in my opinion in smokers. And although some will say this is mostly speculation, I don't think so. I think if, if they were to do a uh, long-term randomized control trial of smokers who do take propranolol and those who don't take propranolol, I will bet you that those who take propranolol will have a much lower incidence of cancer. And smokers, in general, they're predisposed to hypertension. So propranolol can be a great option to control that long-term and live longer, uh, reduce the risk of stroke, reduce the risk of heart attacks, etc. It might make you a little bit fat, but I mean, in my opinion, the reduction in cancer risk is worth it if you're a smoker. The best thing you can do is stop smoking, but not everybody's going to do that. So, yeah, that is my hack, and I think it's very, very valuable. I think it's worth considering for every smoker, at least worth considering. I'm not saying every smoker should go and take propranolol. Go and talk to your doctor. I'm not your doctor, right? So, anyway, that was my hack, and I hope you appreciate it. I'll leave the citations in the comments down below or in the description, whatever. Uh, thank you for watching. Give us a like, a comment, and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Thank you again and goodbye.